The Radio Whammo Breakfast. The voice of the creative economy. With Vincent Herringer. He's joining us uh, from Idealog, Good Magazine's Groove Guide, all the others as well. G'day, Eddie Vincent. Good morning, Whammo. Good morning. Now, you've been thinking about the climate change conference uh, that's going on, the climate change, change talks in Cancun. Yes, I have. Well, the, this is a follow up on the um, rather dismal meeting in Copenhagen last year where the you know, big economies tried to thrash out a deal about limiting the carbon uh, dioxide equivalent emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and um, you know those talks kind of founded on the detail and the collapse really between the US and China. So they try to pick up on where that left off and see if they can find a better solution in the, in the lovely resort of Cancun in Mexico, and that, those talks are underway now with some ministers turning up today. Um, or at least last night, I think, they um, was the, the first of their meetings. So starting to get reports now about um, how those talks are going. Yeah, and uh, uh, there is some fear, though, that the um, Kyoto Agreement is going to be uh, scrapped in, in favour of something that's far more lightweight. Yes, the problem is the, um, the reality now is biting, and both the um, American and Chinese economies have realised that you know, putting caps in the price on carbon is actually going to damage their economies or shrink their economies in the short term and you know in a recession that's a very hard message to sell people that um, everyone's focus is on jobs and growth um, and it's very hard mm. to see the immediate um, benefits of reducing your your, your emissions um, because the the impact is on the incumbent industries to um, you know to spend and also to migrate to new technologies such as you know, renewable sources of energy. Mm. So all, the, all these ministers from all these countries end up in this one place and they're all talking over these tables, but they're all bringing the, their own baggage, aren't they? And their, their own baggage is all the, the politics back at home and where their government is currently sitting, what their majority is and how many votes they've got, all that kind of thing. Yeah, and also there's the, um, the ongoing fight between America and China is a lot over the um, verification of... China's claims that it is reducing. They, they, China claims, for instance, that it's well on track to having reduced its um, its um, carbon emissions um, or equivalent greenhouse gas emissions down to 45% of its, um, or it has reduced by 45% of its 2005 emissions, which is quite a claim. But the problem from the West's uh, point of view is that this, the, these claims are not open to, to testing or to verification. So mm. there's some doubt as to whether China is is doing that. But it's also about where the burden is, isn't it? Because because uh, on the on the other hand, China, as a developing nation, says, "Well, you guys have been um, p- polluting the atmosphere for you know 100 years or so. We've only just really sort of started on this bandwagon." Our turn to pollute the atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, But at the same time, um, China is also um, the world's largest polluter now, um, given the growth in its economy and the the amount of um, coal-fired electricity generation it makes. It's no wonder, you know, the growth of their their, um, their car economy. You know, they've they've shifted from from bikes and and walking to um, to, to cars and motorbikes. So, um, yeah, to be expected, I suppose, the industrialisation of that huge place is contributing majorly. But what people don't realise is just how aggressively China um, and Japan um, are investing in clean tech solutions. And so at the same time as this sort of this kind of despair about the um, the emissions kind of uh, programmes at, at places like Cancun, in the meantime, innovation in uh, clean tech is just continuing the pace. Mm. Well, that brings us on to the um, sort of second half of this talk um, about the issue of sustainability and, and, and what sustainability actually means post-recession um, or during this recession. Yeah, I think what's happening is, what's kind of interesting, we launched Good Magazine, which was New Zealand's guide to sustainable living, and this is a little micro-experience ex- of how the, the sustainability market is changing. That When we launched, you know, it was very much to the fore um, of the government's agenda, and it was very much on people's minds about living a more sustainable life. Mm. What's been interesting is that the the market really is changing, Wemmer. We've just relaunched Good Magazine with this current edition. that You'll see it out on newsstands. And what we've done to... Um, you, you really, you know, being in the media, you really pick up on the sensitivities of where advertising is at, where, where sentiment is at, because, um, you know, you're out there every month trying to sell... Um, publication and yeah. where, where it's really changed is um, and we would notice the change and, and ourselves had to re- 
change our own language, is all around the perception of sustainability as a sacrifice, as a cost, as a burden, as a guilt. And that's kind of interesting in that people, um, on the whole, um, have the sense of guilt about um, living a more sustainable life, but they don't necessarily want to buy into the sacrifice. So it's almost like sustainability has changed its language now to words about health and happiness and self-sufficiency mm. and, and the garden and home and hearth have become a, a much more, I suppose, important focus for people. And we changed the language in Good Magazine to, to drop as much as we can references to eco, sustainability, green, and focus on, yeah. I suppose, the benefits you know, of health and happiness and home and um, sense of uh, contentment with what you've got. And that seems to have a much more resonating effect on people. And we're noticing the same change of language in business, that sustainability really is out of fashion in business, but actually the core values are still being pursued, but the language has changed. So re- but so it is only a language change? Like, like The actual end result should still be the same? Is that right? Well, um, take for instance, in, um, there's a huge movement in procurement and in, in management of property and, and assets. So if you talk to people in the business world whose business it is to look after, I don't know, say a, a fleet of cars or, or buildings, um, those guys don't talk about sustainability so much. They talk about the whole of life cost of an investment. So uh, someone that's buying a fleet of cars for a company in the past, it would have been cost-driven. Now there's, it is still cost-driven, but it's looked at over the course of the whole life of the car and also will fit into, say, the branding or positioning of the company, which might want to be seen as a responsible citizen. Now, these guys barely ever talk about eco or green or sustainability, but they do. They cast it in different language, but it's the same effect or the same sentiment that they want to be a responsible investor, responsible not just for the cost now but the costs later or what happens to that fleet of cars or that use of energy for your I don't know say for your your refrigeration system. Mm. Interesting well here those um, kinds of issues and more discussed in uh, Good Magazine also celsius.co.nz Thanks Vincent. Thank you Webo. Cheers Vincent Herring and there from Tangible Media Time now here